here at the Mo'olelo Group offices. Perfect. Okay. So there's a lot of places that we could start today, mm -hmm. but let's start with what you're doing here at Mo'olelo Group. Oh my, okay, so I, so literally this is like the question I get all the time, right? It's like, what do you do? I mean, even when I worked at the hotels and I have a title like cultural advisor or Hawaiian cultural director, people still are like, but what does that mean? Like, what do you do? And, and I, I, we can go at that a bunch of different ways. And, and I guess so on one side of things, what I do is, is I just, I, I'm a storyteller mm -hmm. and I try and connect Hawaiian culture into other businesses and for businesses that are, you know, like in Hawaii, every, you know, our main economic driver is tourism. So mm -hmm. making sure that people are telling the right stories, that we are communicating real culture, not fake culture because we had 100 plus years of fake culture so it's making sure we do that and then on a deeper level and on other levels i guess it's it's um it's just finding ways to you know do that in in innovative and exciting ways not it's not just like teaching ukulele lessons and making sure people pronounce things correctly but also right. just you know finding like the the i don't know the more the more esoteric, the more spiritual, or the more kind of like systems-based ways of integrating culture mm -hmm. than just the, you know, do this, not that kind of thing. So since you brought it up, and I have this kind of slated for a little bit later in our conversation, but right away you kind of started with the 100 years of fake culture, uh -huh. which I think it's really important to kind of set the stage for what happened to the culture here from like the banning of hula to, you know, potentially the loss of language. Um, can you kind of set that stage for us and talk a little bit about that hundred years of fake culture? Sure. How long do we have? No. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess try, you know, to try and wrap things up like really simply, right. What happened here in the Hawaiian islands is what happened largely anywhere else that was colonized, you know, during, you know, the, the 400 plus years of, you know, colonization, the imperial age and new imperial age throughout, you know, history. Mm -hmm. um, when the first Westerners arrived and the first documented time is Captain Cook arriving in 1778 um, on his third voyage throughout the Pacific, modern estimates say there are around 1 million native Hawaiians living here. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, a, a, we've got 1.4 million people in the island now. So in terms of like, if you think about you know, size, right? Um, you know, 1 million people is, is, it's not a small bit. It's not just a couple, you know, naked natives running around. It's a, right. it's a large civilization. Um, 60 years after that in 1840, there was a census done and there were about 40,000 native Hawaiians alive. So, you know, you're talking about a 98%, yeah. you know, decimation that was the, case everywhere, right? Smallpox, diseases, the common cold, influenza wiped out the population. We had a, you know, 90% infant mortality rate. Um, and because of that, there was a massive loss of transmission of knowledge, right? Um, alongside of that loss of people and of knowledge was the, you know, importation of, well, these are beautiful tropical islands and we're going to sexualize the native and and create this romanticized version of what hawaii is and so we got you know contiki and blue hawaii and gidget goes west and all those right. kind of things you know where you know um surf culture and this concept of the south pacific even though hawaii's not in the south pacific and tiki culture you know and all of that gets built out of not just hawaii but throughout the entire Pacific, mm -hmm. largely um, sort of spread because of the Pacific theater during World War I and World War II, right? Because of everything happening throughout the Pacific, when the wars were done and those vets went back home, they took the stories of, you know, 
meeting the cute island girl and the Mai Tai and et cetera, et cetera, back home. And it sort of built from there. And then you add on mass travel with, you know, first, you know, like the Lurleen and steamships and then the cruise ships, but then later on, obviously, plane travel and the, democratiz the democratization of like that ability to travel right. and the fact that you could get to Hawaii without, you know, a passport and do so relatively cheaply and easily um, meant that that you know, the ability for foreigners to tell our stories to an increasingly large number of people. And then you just sort of like push that snowball down the hill, you know, and it just mm -hmm. keeps getting bigger and rolling. And when, you know, at, at some time Hawaiians make up, you know, 10 to 19% of the population, that means that, you know, eight of our, out of every 10 people are not from here and just kind of making up whatever they want potentially, or just the telephone game of telling stories that were true in the beginning, but aren't true now. Right, right. Now, I'm just thinking of how I wanna phrase this question, but what are some of the biggest misconceptions that even today are still out there, whether it's about Hawaii in general or the Hawaiian people? that you encounter? Now I've got to think about which way I want to take this. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot and I think the question like now in 2022 is even way different than it was 15 years ago right. because there has been a shift in tourism and how we talk about native cultures and, and not just Hawaiian culture, but indigenous cultures around the world, right? Um, you know, in an American audience, we can look and say, oh yeah, you know, the, the Native Americans, you know, were, you know, you know, were, were, were really smart and they were connected with their environment. And that, that consciousness is around now way more than it was 20, 30, 40 yeah. years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So growing up, you know, if I was, you know, back in the mid eighties, we literally got like, do you guys live in grass huts? Mm -hmm is there indoor plumbing? Like when I visit you, do you have a toilet kind of question? And it's like, well, I mean, yeah, we get like millions of people, you know, that kind of a thing, right? Is there a pizza hut? Um, right. We got those kind of questions growing up when I'd visit people in, uh, uh, you know, on the US continent, like family and friends. Nowadays, it's more, you know, n some people don't even know that native Hawaiians still exist. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, because we're not, you know, and, and this is, there's a big difference between if you're in the California coast, you live in LA, you're bombarded with Hawaii images, you know, all the right. time, right. Whether it's an airline or whatever, but as, but when you start moving into the interior, right. Mm -hmm. Of, of the United States, you know, if you're in, in like in New York, you know, or those urban areas or, or the West coast, you're somewhat familiar, right because you're marketed to, mm -hmm. but you know, in, in the, in the Midwest and, and, and most of the American, because there's such an influx of tourism here and it's as of right now, not being capped. So you have a lot of tourists coming in where, how do you continue to build on that culture versus just constant tourism? And it just kind of falling to the wayside to tourism dollars right well I, I, there's sort of like it's like two sides of the coin right mm -hmm. there's one-on-one -on -one interactions and not necessarily one-on-one -on -one, but you know me and you right. talking or me and you know like a family group you know one to one one to two one to five one to twenty me standing up and talking to you know a group of you know 500 people in a, in a convention room or something right there's that which we can is easy to change in the sense that if we can put somebody that loves Hawaii and Hawaiian culture and is Hawaiian and grounded and, and can like have a conversation like this, yeah. if we could do that with the 10 million visitors that came here, you know, this year, or whatever it may be, if, but like, we can't even do that with the people that live here. You know, there's people that live in Hawaii for 30 years and they're like, they've never had a conversation like this. They've never 
you know, it's they're, you know, expats like living in Costa Rica that don't speak Spanish, right? I mean, it's it's a they've created this insular life and economy and and world that they're in their you know funnel, right? In their in their in their silo. Um, but that's you know that's the easiest way, right? Is like how do we connect people? But then the question that you're asking, really, right, is the industry. It's devoid of a, a physical being. Mm -hmm. How do we change that? How do we change the 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 non-physical person, the website, the news feed, the profile, the article? How, how do we shift all of that? Right. It's almost like shifting, as you're talking, I'm thinking it's almost like shifting the idea of what maybe vacation is. Because when you think about it, uh -huh. it's, you know, if we go back to pioneer days of America, quote unquote vacation, right, would be, okay, the train's finally here and now I can go back out east and see a family member that couldn't come across the plains with us. Right. There was no vacation escape to another destination right. so this is a such a modern day problem uh -huh. and when we think of vacation we're like everybody's definition is so different like my definition is not just go sit still somewhere mm -hmm. on a beach like, right i live here and i have a really it's just my personality of having a hard time to just sit and do nothing right i would like to be swimming snorkeling hiking participating in something like being a part of right. versus somebody who's coming here to stay at a resort for five days, drink their Mai Tais on the beach and maybe not even leave the resort. Right. So it's, it's almost like it's hard to get through to those people. What even just doing that and not leaving the resort may still impact the people living here. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I, you're see I, I'm, la I'm laughing because you're, you're starting to you're like scratching you're getting right but like we have to meet people where they are yeah right and and by and large you know we have created a, a we in terms of like humanity right. has created a society in which we for a long time into the future we will have a huge portion of travelers mm -hmm. who want to show up get into a resort sit on a chair, be served, look at a name tag, mispronounce the name tag, laugh about it, be kind of sad, but not drink a Mai Tai and 12 and, and like not have a, not get out of that bubble. Right. But for the same, you know, we have people that want to just, oh man, throw me in the deep end. I want to be fully immersed. And those people can be the same people at different stages of their life. Right. Different people within the same family group. Right. So like parents might be chilling on the on the beach or at the pool, but the kids are in these workshops all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so part of, you know, the problem and the opportunity is, is can we provide experiences that meet people where they are? Right. Yeah. And that's really hard because, you know, as a young, you know, radical Hawaiian, I want to be like, you know, screw those guys. You know, everyone needs to take classes yeah. and this and that. But but then they put their walls up and, and you, you don't actually achieve anything, mm -hmm. right? Now, it is a modern problem, right? And, and you brought up, you know, pioneer days and, and like this is where, you know, we can get all sorts of crazy, but if you remember like the Canterbury Tales, right? right yeah. So that is, right. you know, prior to that, and I forget when that was written, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, the only people that traveled were royalty yeah. right the aristocrats bourgeoisie the really rich or or or, or armies or pilgrims right yeah. or 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 pilgrims yeah, right headed, and headed to... yeah and there's a big difference there right because as a pilgrim you're you know you're fleeing it. yeah you're, you're you know yeah and if you're and those that were on pilgrimages to places like the holy land were sleeping by the roadside right Totally. And if you were like, you know, so the way we think of vacation and tourism is, you know, what was once prescribed only to the affluent, the affluent, whatever, 
and but because of you know the progress of civilization has been democratized made cheaper made easier right if you had to have you know 10 horses and you know all these carts and servants to move your trunks and yourself that's way harder than having you know a little rolly bag and yeah. jumping on a you know 299 round trip you know flight flying at 400 miles an hour yeah. over the ocean like we've made it super easy throw it to the middle class blah 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 i mean like you know that's yeah. that's what it is right and with that comes the one that it's not it's not as special right but also you know marketing and has created this like escapist yeah. philosophy which is tied into you know being a tropical island like when people vacation and they go to like a cold place mm -hmm. they might act different than when they come to like a, a tropical place right and it's yeah. it's so interesting but yeah i mean we do have to change how people think about vacation and we are i mean i think we see and whether it's just like greenwashing brownwashing you know whatever you want to call it like woke you know like travel culture like yeah. everyone's talking about you know doing better so mm -hmm. to speak yeah um whether it's the airlines or the hotels you know but like how do we how do we actually make that shift? It's a, you know, it's been a hundreds of years to get here. Yeah. So if we're going to turn the ship, it's it's still gonna, it's not a it's not a small ship. It's going to take time. And part of your role in that is this cultural training that you're doing at some of the resorts locally with the employees. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, I so I do employee training um, with employees and like we talked about the two sides of the coin if i can you know i can only talk to so many people every day mm -hmm. and i can do my best to you know put all my passion and my love for this place and its people and the culture and what i feel like it has to bring to the world about compassion and understanding and empathy and respect for the natural environment and each other and you know all that kind of stuff but I can only talk to so many people. Yeah. But in my mind, like every employee or colleague or whatever that I get to talk to at a particular company, like if I can just plant that seed, then that's, you know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 of me out there talking to, and then and then it, the, the phone tree, you know, the yeah. web grows, right? Mm -hmm. So today I was doing a very basic, like a crash course in like history and culture. So you know, how Hawaiians got, how early Polynesians got to these islands, how Hawaiian as a culture developed, um, you know, the, the base sort of like system of what our culture was, and then all the way up until today, right? So going through the kingdom of Hawaii, the overthrow, you know, the 1800s and 1900s, and then going all over the place, you know, with that. And we do language class because for a lot of these people, they're in like tur the, you know tourist-facing jobs, or it's hotels or activities, and so it's like, well, how do you pronounce things correctly? You know, it's not Hawaii. You know, I'm going to Hawaii. You know, it's 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 Hawaii or Hawaii. It's the three syllables, and what does that mean? And you know, all those kind of things, so that one they know and that they can tell the right story, and that hopefully by communicating these things in the right way and and that people feel like a sense of co-ownership mm -hmm. of of you know being committed to that it's a real place you know mm -hmm. i always tell everyone like we don't want everyone to come to hawaii because we don't have the space but what we want is that those that do come they go back home and you know everyone that comes here goes oh man it's so special it's it's just there's something there you know it's the aloha spirit it's this and that but it's like the aloha spirit can live anywhere yeah. so when you go back home you know to springfield or you know minneapolis or wherever it may be like take that there like build that there plant that seed there mm -hmm. right because that's if you liked it here i'm sure your community back home will like it there like how do we just spread that you know when you say aloha spirit, 
what does that fundamentally mean to you? Oh, yeah. Well, and I, 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 mm, I don't like the term Aloha Spirit, but it is, it, I used it because that's what we hear. Yeah. Like, so when we hear, oh, sorry, yeah, please. Because, yeah, yeah, no. Because I think the um, story of the breath mm -hmm. and, because that's something that I didn't learn until I came here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think many of our listeners will know what I'm talking about mm. when I use breath to right. talk about this. Yeah. So, right. I, I think a normal layman, you know, aloha is one of those things that, like, everyone knows the word, like everyone knows a shaka, mm -hmm. or it, it's outgrown the culture it came from, right? In the same way that, like, you could say burrito or spaghetti and it's sort of like owned by the collective consciousness yes. now, in a sense, right? Although we feel very protective of aloha. Mm -hmm. People say aloha means hello, goodbye, and I love you, right? It's a greeting, it's a farewell, and it's a way of expressing this sense of love, compassion, connection, empathy to each other. And that's where most people stop. And if that's what they get, cool. Mm -hmm. You know, that's good, right? Um, the easy, well, we could like talk for hours about aloha, but an easy way to think about it is also in how we physically do aloha, we show aloha, right? And for most, for most people like in the modern world, if they've ever seen like James Cameron's avatar, and now we're going to get avatar two, so yeah. we're going to see it again. And you see those big blue people, the Navi on Pandora, greet each other and you see them like touch nose to nose and right and and, and breathe and and share breath right james cameron spent a lot of time in he has spent time in hawaii but he was in aotearoa in new zealand and he saw the maori the native people of new zealand called maori do that um down there they call it the hongi and we call it the honi and throughout all of Polynesia, all almost all Polynesian cultures greet with a honey, right? And they come together and they touch nose to nose and they share breath. They they exchange ha. And our word for breath is ha. And it's both like breath, just regular breath. Hey, you know, we're breathing, you know? And it is at a higher level on a different sort of layer of symbolism, it's spiritual breath. Right, it's the first breath that a baby breathes when they emerge from their mother's womb, <gasps> you know, and take that first breath of life. It's the last breath that an elder breathes when they depart this world into the next. And in ancient times, there was, you know, like some elders, wisdom keepers would would wait around, you know, would bring their students near them as they were going to die, and sort of like, <sighs> and like put their last breath into them, and it was sort of like. Some people say it was like, you know, Buddha speaking something and becoming instantly enlightened. Like they would all of a sudden know all this knowledge and songs and chants and prayers that they'd never known before, right? Just through ha osmosis, you know? But it's also every breath we breathe in between those. Um, alo means um, the, the, the front of a person. Uh, or the, the the front or the forward facing side it means a lot of other things too but and so if you imagine all living things have an alo and a kua your kua is your 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 back um on a, a plants uh the kua is like the side with the spine on, on like leaves mm -hmm. the alo is the shiny pretty side right um so aloha is alo and this is one interpretation of it. Aloha is essentially like presenting the front of you to another person or another alo, right? And only living things can have alo. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're not going to like a door or like, or, you know, like a house mm -hmm. or a car, right? Um, you're going to a, something that is alive and you're exchanging ha. So when you see somebody do a honi and come, you know, nose to nose and, and touch and exchange breath, it's the physical acting out of aloha. Okay. And then we go, well, well, that's cool. But what does it mean? Right. Western people greet each other with a handshake. Mm 
-hmm. Handshake comes from Roman days where, you know, people were, majority still are, right-handed. I'm taking my hand off of my sword scabbard. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you that I do not have a weapon in my, in my main weapon hand to extend it to you as a, as a show of peace. And then, you know, we grasp hands, but the left hand is still holding onto my dagger in case you get crazy and I'll stab you because I don't trust you that much, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the home, but then, then the Hawaiians greeted each other with the Honi, which says that, hey, listen, like, here is my physical life. I can give you, you know, my, my food, okay? I share my food with you, but I cannot eat for months. I can go on hunger strike. I can voluntarily not eat for months. I can survive, okay? Um, I can share with you my water, okay? Water is really important. Some people, you know, think water is one of the most precious resources that we have, right? But I cannot drink for days, for a week, and still survive. Not happily, but I can do it, right? But if I stop breathing as a human, if I stop breathing for more than a couple minutes, I will die. But when I greet you, a stranger, I share with you that which is most important to my physical existence here on this earth the most sacred thing to keep my body alive. Like basically giving you my blood, right? Without that I die, right? But my blood has to be oxygenated, okay? So my breath, I'm saying, I give you this. We share this. And that is aloha, right? Um, so long story to the short story of what is aloha. And there's, and there's like so much more to it, but that's a really good, that is the, what was taught to me that always really got me because it's, we talked about like, how do we get people to break down these barriers yeah. to see, you know, to connect. And it's like the understanding that like, you know, it, that is Aloha, right? Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. That was, I think that's such an important piece to understand and to appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. We, have sat here for about an hour and talked story. If you could sit with anybody, living or dead, and talk story. That's such a hard question. Living or dead and talk story. I have so many people. I don't know. I mean, see, I just like love like history and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think it would be, you know, from Hawaiian, if we're talking about like Hawaiian culture, I think it would be so awesome to talk with Kamehameha. Um, he was just amazingly intelligent. Um, just uh, uh, he understood strategy, battlefield strategy, but also just like reading people, understanding people, understanding diplomacy. People think of him as a warrior, and he was, but you know, the, 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 biggest weapon in an ancient Hawaiian warrior's arsenal was oratory, was diplomacy. If you can avoid bloodshed, that is how you are the best leader. Um, I would have loved to talk to Queen Lili Okalani, our last reigning monarch, um, you know, because she spoke five languages, composed 200 plus songs. Um, I mean, she's incredible and just to go through what she went through. Um, but then, yeah, there's all sorts of other, like, non-Hawaiian people that I would have, like, I'd love to, to speak with as well. And luckily, alive people, I've gotten to talk to a lot of my, like, idols and, and heroes, yeah. um, which, you know, I'm like, people like Auntie Hokulani Holt or Auntie Pua or Kalei Nuhiva, like, you know, you know, Kahulines, Naone, like people that I are like my ultimate idols that I get to like have conversations with and learn about things. So like, I feel like I'm very blessed, you know, there. And then there's U.S. presidents that I love to talk to and all sorts of, yeah, I don't know, old philosophers and stuff. Yes. Don't get me started on that. There's no, I can't, I can't pick one. Um, if there's any wisdom or information or a piece of history that you think should be left with our listeners, what would you like to leave with our listeners today that we maybe didn't talk about? 
Oh, give me some example. Like, what do you mean? What, like, what? Uh... I don't know. Is there anything that maybe is a flashpoint of your mission or your vision or what you feel your purpose is, or something that when you go and you give these trainings or you have the chance to participate in you know, a larger conversation on, on a bigger scale that you just go, oh, I can't wait to share this knowledge or this piece of information because this is the heart of, of my purpose or yeah. it's such a big part of understanding this culture. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good question. I guess my, like my friends that know me and have heard me talk a lot will always joke that I'll like slide world peace into mm -hmm. a conversation, which somehow like happens because, but like, I think it's such a, so without, you know, spending another half an hour just going down some weird tangent rabbit hole. I mean, I think a really important thing and a part of my mission and it, is part and parcel with Hawaiian culture, but is so much bigger is like, there is no other. We are more alike than we are different. We have more in common. We have more similar than we do the things that separate us. And all it takes is, you know, breaking bread with somebody. All it takes is, you know, popping a beer. All it takes is, you know, just sitting around and, and having a conversation. And, you know, we see it every day it's like the, you know, that, that white grandma that texted the black kid about like coming over for Christmas or whatever. And, yeah. and it's been like nine years now, you know, and like still hanging out and, and a new family has been made. And like, you know, and we always, we're so quick to show up with a full cup, mm -hmm. you know, and be like, you know, but they're not in my group that they're not in my circle. Like, and that used to serve us and it still does but we need to know when to put that belief down mm -hmm. and recognize that there really is, you know, other, there's only us, mm -hmm. you know, there's only us and we're all similar. And whether it's, you know, the people we're thinking about going to war with halfway around the world or like the person next door, you know, yes, there's bad, bad actors out there, bad people out there, but you know, by and large, you know, there's always, we're human, right? And there's, we're 99.9999% similar. And we just need to, why do we want to focus on the 0.001% that is different? Because now it's no longer serving us yeah. right? as individuals or as society. That, that would be, that's my thing.